I like Kelly said, I'm John Resnick and I'm the Yankee of the bunch. I'm up from way farther north than most of y'all. Uh, first things first, I, I don't talk good. You're gonna realize that pretty quick. And, but if I, if I start talking like either one of these guys, just yell or shout at me and let me know. Or, <laughs> you know, if, if you want me to go over a slide some more, just shout out and, and I'll stop right there and go over the slide some more. But after the championship game this last year, I think, I, I think I'm gonna switch out Farmer Fran here for the LSU coach. <laughs> First things first, to make sure you're all awake, I'm gonna have a quiz. What is the one thing that life cannot live without? Is it oxygen, light, water, or soil? You can have, you don't need oxygen, you can have anaerobic beings. You don't need light, you think about the bottom of an ocean. Soil, you can have hydroponics, you don't, you don't need soil. The one thing you need is water. That's, that's always our most important thing. And this has kind of been covered before. This is our, our pan evaporation. And I'm up here, I'm, I'm quite a bit better than you guys. But I, I'm still screwed too, so. <laughs> now thinking about where our water goes, uh, we have transpiration which is, is, is through the plant, and that's a good thing. But we also have evaporation. If, if your ground's not covered, you're gonna have a lot more evaporation. You, you saw the slides earlier about the heat, about the, the soil getting up to, 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 way, to the way Jim Johnson likes to stake 135 degrees. That's, that's pretty hot, and you're losing a lot of water that way. So if you can cover your soil, then, then the only water you're losing is, is just the transpiration that's, that's you're gaining through the plant. So I wanted to talk about, about plowing. And it's, you know, sometimes it's necessary. If we're honest with ourselves, it, sometimes you have to plow. Sometimes that's just where we are. You know, sometimes you need medicine. It's not, it's not good to take that all the time. You want to get off that medicine, but sometimes you need that medicine to, to kickstart. But looking at plowing, they, you, you got to realize if you go out there with a, a one-way or a disc, you're going to lose a lot of moisture and a lot of residue. You, you can be kind of selective with what plow you use. Like we use a lot of sweet plows. Barry talked about the hamies, they, they, the plow that saved the plains. Now look at the moisture that you lose whenever you plow. If you go out there with the disc or one way, you lose a third of an inch of moisture in one day. And that's only part of the story. You go after four days, you've lost half an inch of moisture in four days if you went out there with, with this one way or a disc. Whereas if you went with the sweet plow where you're retaining more of the residue on the top, you're, you're losing, what is that, about a fourth of, a fourth of the water. So you're still, you're still plowing, you're still killing weeds or whatever you need to do, but you're way better off. You're saving a lot more water by changing what you use the plow with. Getting back to getting to where I started in 2006 was my first year farming on my own on some dry land. In the fall of 2006, I put in a wheat crop, and I mean it, was, it rained like crazy in the September right before I planted that wheat. So I thought I was off to a really good start. But in 2007, I mean it was a real good winter, and a lot of our fields made 50 or 60 bushel dry land wheat, but mine didn't make anywhere near that. You can, as you can see right there, a March storm. Took a bunch of my, this is my field over here. We had big north winds, this covered up my neighbor's fence. And they, they weren't too happy with me then. But the, the biggest thing I want to point out is I cut my yield in half just because my limiting factor was I didn't have the right fertilizer, I didn't have enough growth. I had too many weeds. But you, you always want to make sure that your limiting factor is water. You don't want to have a nitrogen or any kind of deficiency, phosphorus. So you always want water to be the lowest stave on your barrel, because that's that's the pretty much the one thing you can't control. And also, I learned that you you definitely need some residue, or else you you're just going to blow away. Okay, the reason I'm here today is because I have a dry land corn fetish, and I'm going to get into this. In 2009, I started I. I started talking to Dr. Stewart at WT at the Dryland Institute. 
and he, he said he'd do some experiments on our land and we'd, we'd have some trials. And we looked at different planting configurations for dryland corn and dryland milo. And they were trying to keep the, keep the milo from tillering. So he had several different, he had three different configurations. You had the normal planting, and then you had clusters, which I'll, I'll show on the next slide. And then you had clumps, which that's what this is. It's kind of like old checkerboard planting. All the plants are real close. And you had a one by one skip. And I'm on 30 inch row, so one by skip, one by one skip turns into 60 inches. And uh, we did this trial, it was a replicated trial. It had three replications of all four of these different geometries. And part of it went through a dry line corner and it went into a field that we put four and a half inches of water on. And here's the different configurations. Up here on top is the, the clumps. And the idea was to put three plants real close together. See, the 76.2 centimeters is 30 inches. It's 8.5, that's, that's less than four inches apart. So during, in this little group of, of plants, you have three per foot, and then you have a big skip here. And in the row beside it, you, you alternate these. So these three plants are in the, the skip of the next row. And that was a, it was a five times the population. So if, if my planter was set to drop 60,000, that would put down 12,000 plants per acre. And the next one is clusters. And this one, there were five plants in a row, followed by five skips. And up here, this was, this is on a Maximerge 2 planter, so it's, it's a 30 cell disc. So there's, there are three plants and then 27 skips. But here there's five plants and five skips. So this gives you a two times a, if two times the population of what your planter is set at. So to get twelve thousand plants per acre, we're we're telling our planter the plant twenty-four thousand per acre. And the next one is our our one by one skip, which is sixty inch corn. And you can see all it's the it's the same twenty-four thousand plants per acre would give you twenty-four thousand on the planter would give you twelve thousand per acre. And down on the bottom, you see the, the normal planting. And if you look over here, this 43 centimeters, that's 17, between 17 and 18 inches. So the reason we're looking at this is if you have a corn plant, you're not going to sustain a population of 20,000 plants per acre. So for dry line, you really got to, or for low irrigation, you really got to get the population down. But the problem is once you get low enough, if you're in 30 inch rows, then you have these plants, these, they're 17 or 18 inches apart. So when the, when the plant first comes up and starts growing, you know, he's looking around, he's got 18 inches around him of, of real good moisture, and he doesn't have any competition for anything else. So that, that plant's going to want to put on more vegetative growth, and he's going to use a lot more moisture early rather than later. Versus over here, you know, in skip row, they always talk about later in the season that as that plant grows, when it's little, it can't get this water here, but later in the season when it's getting tall and the roots are getting bigger, they're going over here and they're pulling water out that this one on the bottom already wasted. And here's a, a corn plant. I took a picture of the tillers. You can see this is one, this all right here is one plant. You can see here's the main shank, but right here you have two massive tillers. And look how much vegetative growth you have out of this thing. But these tillers, they're, they're not going to give you any grain at all. In fact, they're, they're, I mean, they're probably going to help spread disease because they'll, they'll make, usually one of them will make a, an ear, like on a, a typical ear, if, a leaf ear, and the other one will make a tassel ear. And there'll just be a few kernels, but usually they'll, they'll be covered in, in, in disease. Okay, going back to the experiment in 2009, we tried early corn early. So we were using 105 day corn and we planted the first week of April. And you can see here, here's the dry land. This was dry land wheat. It was wheat in 2008 and planted the corn in 2009. And you can see here, this was the irrigated. It was pretty good, pretty good residue that was strip-tilled, strip-tilled sorghum stalks. Here's a picture of the, the 60 inch you can also see the wheat residue, and then going over here, you can see the, the sorghum residue. 
But if you look over here, the thing you always see, high residue versus low residue. Which one's greener? Which one's bigger? This one over here is bigger because there's less residue. The ground's warmer. It's growing faster. Over here, it's, all, it's delayed a little just because the ground's cooled off. In 2009, we didn't get a whole lot of rain during the summer. You can see it was, it was getting pretty hot. It was burning the leaves on top. But here's a picture of the 60-inch corn. And here's the results of, of that first experiment. We had three replications of each. I'm going to go to the This is the irrigator on the sorghum stalks. This the control made 90 bushels with four, that was four inches of water added. And the, the skip, 60 inch, made 88. So you lost about two bushels by planting, planting wider on that, on that replication. And the clusters, planting in a cluster, it was basically the same. Cluster or a clump was the same as, as just normal planting. And this is all, this is 12,000 populations what we dropped from, it was the same from the dry land to the irrigated, 12,000 all the way. And then here's full dry land, you, you can see that that was in the lower part of the, the pictures I showed. And following dry land wheat, here's where you started to see a difference. The control, the normal planting was 39 bushels, but 60 inch made 45. So again, we gained five or six bushels right there just, just by changing geometry and doing nothing else. As you can see, the cluster and the, and the clump configuration did the same thing. And we also had some, just a little ways on the other side of that field, it was dryland corn after dryland sorghum. And you can see what a difference the dryland wheat, just the residue from that and, and the fallow period gaining moisture, it made 10, probably 10 bushels difference. You can see over there, we gained about four, two to four bushels just by changing the configuration. So in 2010, it was a pretty wet year, so we, we decided we'd, we'd do the same experiment. So we did it in the exact same place. It was dry land, corn on corn. Uh, and that 2010 was a pretty wet year. Uh, so the stand, we actually had trouble with stand and goosenecking just because the just because it was so wet early. But the results in 2010 was a little better. 62 bushel corn, and you can see uh, 55 bushels if we just plant a normal. But if we change the configuration of the plants any little bit, it helped. But the clumps helped the most. And. You know, I was feeling pretty good in 2010, and two years in a row I had dryland corn. It wasn't, it wasn't the best in the world, but at least I harvested something. I got to 2011, is that was, that was horrible. <laughs> so 2011 to 20, 2013, it was, we didn't hardly make anything. But I wanted to tell you about a story about, we had some CRP, it'd been CRP for 25 years. In 2011, you know, it was dry enough, that grass didn't grow. Before this, in 2010, that thing was a matted mess, and we, we thought, this is, we, there's no way we, could, way we could do anything with this. There's way too much residue, we can't, can't do anything, way too much grass. But 2011, you know, it set it all back, and it came out of the CRP in 2012, so we decided, or it expired in 2012, so we decided we'd take it out of CRP rather than renew it. So this is just a picture of the CRP, but when we're spraying it in the spring, I'll get back to that one later. Uh, well, instead of plowing it up, we use the coulter rig right here. And I plant my wheat on 10 inch spacing. So I set this coulter rig for 20 inch spacing. And we put some 1034 and a little bit of 32 out there. <clears throat> and I did it twice and I kind of stripped till for wheat. And you can kind of see the rows. You can kind of see a little bit of green in there. That was, that was the wheat that year. But, uh, as I said earlier, we didn't make any crops at all from, any dryland at all from 2011 to 2013. But the biggest thing is we had all that cover out there. Now getting back to, to 2014, you know, it started raining a little bit. So we had a little area that had been irrigated that we switched to sprinkler, so now it was dryland. So it had good residue and had good profile. So we decided to experiment dryland corn just a little bit more. 
So I, I just started grabbing bags, whatever was Aquamax or whatever stuff I had that was drought resistant corn, I put it in there and we just, we just did a little 24 acre field just to, just to try it out. And I used those cluster plates just, just to get my population down. I only put 10.8 thousand plants out there. And that field, it, made, it averaged 90 bushels per acre. So going to 2015, that was another pretty good year. So uh, I, again, I had dry land, corn on corn. So I went in the same area. I did the same thing. I just used open bags of seed. And that one wasn't, wasn't near as good because it got flooded out, believe it or not. But it made about 70 bushels per acre. So uh, I'm getting back in the dry land corn. And in 2016, we had a pretty good profile. We made pretty good wheat in 2015. I, I figured, I'm going to figure out what I want to do. If I want to do these clusters or clumps or anything. So I decided to make a, a big old test plot. So here's the, the seed plate for the clusters. You talk about you have five holes that are open and then you have five holes that are epoxy shut. And you see how it alternates. So I, I put these plates in the, le the left six, left half of my planter. And in the other half I put plates where I did epoxy one, left one open, epoxy one, left one open. And that gave me a, a, an easy test because side by side I had six rows of clusters followed by six rows of just, just normal corn. And when I'd come back, I'd go this way, when you come back that, that six adds on to the other six so you have 12 and 12. You have a, you have a giant field of, of test plots. I did that on that half section I talked about earlier on the CRP and also did it on a, this is a, that's a half mile sprinkler so I have four 30 acre corners. And also this, this corn right here, I split the timings. I did, on this field over here it's all early corn early. In my other field that I talked about earlier, the CRP field, that was all planted in June. So I had population trials, I had variety trials, then I had, had planting date trials and I had the plant geometry trials. And I just want to show you this picture of uh, just how we side dress the corn. If the corn does look good, I've got these PEX tubings. I put those on my sprayer. And if, if it looks good when the corn's, corn's getting a little taller, I apply 28005, which is it's, it's UAN. It's 80% UAN and it's 20% ammonium thiosulfate and the sulfur helps stabilize the, the nitrogen. And here's a picture. Now, I, I talked about, I had 12 rows of clusters like here on the right, followed by 12 rows of the, the conventional planting. If you look at this, everywhere across the field, the conventional spacing, you have two tillers, two giant tillers. But if you look over here where I use the clusters, there's, there's not near as much tillering. Look at the, the residue or the the leaf area over here versus over here. You can see this one's all, the leaf is rolling up a lot more than over here. So basically over here you, you have a lot of wasted leaf area. You gotta evaporate a lot more water just because you have a lot more leaf area. And I worked with WT again that year and they actually did, did some thermal imaging and this top up here is the cluster planting and the, and the bottom is the conventional spacing. And if you look over here, I mean this is just side by side. This is, this is just a few feet away. Twelve rows to twelve rows. You could, you could walk and you can see a lot more stress in these plants versus the cluster plants. And I, this wasn't the best picture, but you could, have the, you could see the difference in the, in the temperature. The plants up here are cooler during the hot, see this is after tassels, so this is, this is like August. They're cooler up here. They're, they're using that water that they saved earlier. The plant that I, uh, that I put normal spacing, it used all that water up early doing it with the tillers. You know, I talked about I had all the room around that plant. It used all that moisture up versus where I had clusters or the different geometries, it's, the roots are able to expand into where the, where the plants weren't before. So here's the results of the early planted corn. I had four corners over there, southwest, northwest. You can see the, the northwest caught one little rain, so it made a fair amount more, but 
here are the cluster planning versus the ESP. Not, they're not magic plants, those are equally spaced plants. So the equally spaced plants made 52 versus clusters. So just changing the geometry added six more bushels on the, on the best corner. Now if you look over here on the southeast corner, changing the geometry, that's all I did. Changing the geometry added 10 more bushels to the yield over there. So instead of 34 and just breaking even, I made 45, which made a little bit of money. It just, just changing the geometry. Okay, now to the June planet corn. That one was a different story. Up, up there, I actually received less rainfall, total rainfall during the season up there. But being later, it, it got into those cooler fall, cooler fall weather. So that corn up there actually averaged 90 bushels per acre. So the point that you can see right here, here's the average of all the clusters that we did and average of all the equally spaced plants. And they're within 0.2 bushels of each other. So on the bottom end, I've gained 10 bushels when it gets dry, but on the top end, I'm not losing any bushels. And also I did a, a population trial right here, 12,000, 14,000, and 17,000. You can see that they're adding 17,000. Those plants stressed a lot more than the 12,000. And they only added about 13 bushels total, even though your, your seed cost is one and a half times. And here's a picture of that corn that year. If you look this way, to the left or to the right, you can see the skip. There's 12 rows of skips. If you look here in the middle, I'm looking down a solid row. If you go 12 rows to the side, you can see right here those clusters. See, there's a, a group here and a gap. But the thing I want to point out about this is you, there's not a giant skip out there. Like if you did a skip row, you can tell there's a skip row. But out here, if you're just driving down the road, looking down the row, you can't hardly tell there's a giant skip out there. The only way you can tell it is if you're looking to the side. And that's a better picture. You can see, you can see the, the cluster planting every other 12 rows. And it's, it's actually, a, it, we didn't even think about this, but it's a diagonal skip row. Your skip is all diagonal. If you, this is a picture from the very first slide. This is what it looks like. When I, I planted the whole field the next year, dry line corn on corn, I planted it all to the clusters. And you can see down the row, there's, there's a giant skip row, and it's, it's diagonal. I, I didn't do anything special. All I did was go one way and come back the other way. And it made this, this, this diagonal skip row pattern. Uh, in 2017, on the second year of the clusters, I planted a 111-day hybrid on, on two-thirds of it and a 103-day hybrid on a third of it. And I don't, I don't know what it was like down here in 2017, but it was like Iowa up there where this cornfield was. You can see how green it was. This was in August. So that field averaged, this is dry line corn on corn, it averaged 110 bushels. But the thing I found out, the 103-day hybrid, it was covered in smut and, and fumonacin. You can see in the back of that combine, it was, it was pretty messy coming out of there. Versus that, that longer season was, it was a fair amount cleaner. And also the 103 day, it, it made about 100 bushels per acre and the 111 day made 120 bushels per acre. Putting them together made the 110, but you can see that the, that just the little longer season helped quite a bit. And, you know, you think you don't have enough water for the longer season, but if you compare them side by side, every time I planted short versus long season, or 103 versus 111, something like that, they tasseled about the same time. The difference is whenever it is after tassel, whenever it gets the dent, whenever it gets the grain fill, the, the short season will kill itself. Well, we don't have to worry about corn, dryland corn killing itself in the, in the Texas panhandle. So, uh, it's, my observation is it's better to use a longer season hybrids and if you do get a rain you can take advantage of it but if you don't it, it doesn't seem to matter okay in 2017 I did a population trial and this was just normal planning they did this several places throughout the panhandle 
and south. They did 8 to 18,000 population. So you get there's 8, 10, 13, 15, and 18. And we did, so there was five of those and there was three replications of each. So it, it was a pain to harvest that thing. But like I was saying earlier, that field made 110 bushels. Look in this test plot where we bumped the population out. That's dry land corn on corn is making 155 bushels per acre. So that's, that's the best case scenario. So, you know, a lot of people want to plant, they say you got to plant 18,000 or keep the population fairly up high just so it won't tiller or, you know, have better ground cover. But look over here at the, at the 10,000, made 120 bushels, 13,138 bushels. There really wasn't a whole lot of added bushels once you, once you get over about 12,000. And this was also a shorter season. This was probably 105 day versus 114 day. And you can see that it made 18,000, planted 18,000 plants, made 155 bushels on the long season, but 18,000 plants in the short season made 135. So I was, if you plant the shorter stuff, you, I just lost 20 bushels per acre just because, it, just because of the plant, even though it didn't, lose any, it didn't use any less water. So here's a graph of what he did. The two varieties that were in that trial were Pioneer 0157, that's 101 day corn, versus Pioneer 0805, that's 108 day corn. You can see the longer season, it almost doesn't matter the population. The shorter season, you can, you know, they're a little better. You can add more population in the shorter season. You almost have to to keep up. But as you can see, that once you got over about 10,000 plants, you know, it's it's making a lot of corn. So that same year, and he's over here somewhere, Cole had the test plot for uh, Ronnie Snell, the same as me. This is in shallow water just to, you know, I figured I'd put this in there just because it's more realistic for a lot of you guys, but you can see about the same thing. That you really don't need that extra population. And you can see the shorter season is it's not near as bad for having more population, but you use that longer season stuff and he fell off the off the end right there. But you can see uh, about ten thousand plants, ten to twelve thousand plants is is about all you need out there. So uh, now going back, uh, that CRP field, this is it right here. So I had pretty good cover and that helped me a lot in 2016 and also 2017. So 2018 for us, we didn't get any rain during the winter. It didn't rain at all until planting. So I figured I'd try my luck as a cotton farmer. I was going to be an insurance cotton farmer nonetheless. So I went out there and I planted cotton in where I had corn for two years. So I had 200, year, 200 bushel corn residue over two years. So there was quite a bit of corn residue out there. So I no-tilled the cotton into those corn stalks and I, I really didn't think it was going to make it. It was, it was a lot of residue in places. But I, I was lucky enough to, to get a stand and then it didn't rain again at all in July. But we got a little rain in August and I ran that chopper in July. And you can see it, it chopped all those stalks up and pushed them down. And here's the cotton. You can see all my, all my volunteer corn from the last two years. But I kept all that residue and I was able to make, that, make a 840 pound dryland cotton crop after, after averaging 100 bushel per acre corn. And this is, this is getting a little rain, but this is still a dry land. I mean, it's not, it's not any more rain than, than y'all get here, really. And uh, the main thing about this is that CRP, I never disturbed it. I never got rid of the residue. I never burned it off or did anything. So it was able to catch, anytime I did get a rain, I caught the rain. And if I got a big rain, you know, it, it pushed into the profile rather than running off. So I, I'm, I was able to take advantage of that. It's the takeaways. About 10,000 plants per acre is, I mean, it's, it's getting, the yield's almost the maximum. The alternative, alternative geometries, they almost always pay. It almost always pays over here to put some kind of skip row to be more conservative 
with what you're planting. And the, the shorter seasons, they, they don't use any less water, but they, they give up quite a bit of yield potential. So I always stick with the, about 110 day or something variety rather than 101. Uh, so the more residue, the better. And going back to that first photo I had of the CRP, you know, that was quite a bit of grass I had in that, in that photo. And that was the best part of the whole field. On the other side, we didn't have near as good of a grass stand. had more weeds, had more Johnson grass and kochia. And it didn't, it was probably a 10 bushel yield difference where it had all that grass and residue. It's quite a bit better versus the other side. So it's always better to have more residue to keep your ground covered and keep it cooler and conserve that moisture. And what I've learned is you either have to plant really early or plant really late. So you have to either beat the heat, which I can't hardly do, but y'all probably can down here, or else you have to be late and you have to get it into the, where it cools down in the fall. And you think about the, the longest day of the year is June 20th, the summer equinox. So if you plant a corn in April and it, it's tasseling on June 20th, you got the longest day of the year that you're messing with. So, and then it's going to fill in the, in the heat of the summer. So it's better to either plant extra early so it's filling early before it gets too hot or you want to plant late where it can get into the fall and get to the cooler weather and it can, it can last longer. And also you, you need to be real conservative with, with the varieties that you choose. Always use an Aquamax or Drought Guard. Or you want the, the most drought tolerant corn you can get. <laughs> and. Uh, what I've seen is corn has, a, has an additive effect on the cotton. If you put cotton after the corn, it's almost always going to do better than if you, d if you just did cotton or, or continuous cotton or something else.